One, two, three. What's going on, everybody? Nick DiVirgilio here, hanging out with the one and only Klaus Hessler. My pleasure, brother. The PACIC convention was just this last weekend and you were there performing and now you're here. And I've known you for quite a long time. Correct. Uh, I think we met in the late 90s was the first time? Early 2000s? Early 2000s, I, what, would, yeah. I would guess, yeah. You play open-handed most of the time. You've really made a thing out of this. You've written up some books with Dom Famularo, the late, great Correct. Dom Famularo. And I would consider you an expert at, the, at this kind of drumming. I don't know how you Thank consider you. yourself, but I consider you an expert. <laughs> so you. I thought it would be really cool, and for our viewers here, if you would show me a little something about open-handed playing, maybe kind of, where would you start if you wanted to kind of dive into this kind of playing? There's several different ways of how you could start this journey. In the first place, I always like to point out that playing open-handed takes away a lot of the limitations that playing with hands crossed actually may offer. But it's not saying that playing with hands crossed is like bad and old-fashioned, whatever, and, and playing open-handed is the hippest thing to do. It's just a different artistic outlet. It's a different way of expressing yourself behind the instrument, but still with the advantages of being able to do a couple of things in a different way as opposed to with hands crossed. There are different avenues that you can travel on, but uh, one of them is um, the, the, the concept of taking a relatively simple sticking, and I'll show you one in a, in a second, yeah. which, uh, which in itself has that feature of leading with both hands, leading right and left, so the sticking is gonna reverse the lead hand. And uh, in that case, it's going, it's going to start from a snare pattern, which is this. So if you were saying the pulse is here, and you even were to add a little accent, which may naturally fall and you would now just take that to the drums and say, okay, I have my left hand on the hi-hat, I play this open-handed, my right hand on the snare, and all of a sudden you get this. And all of a sudden you get a little piece of extra vocabulary, which of course sounds different as opposed to the grooves you played before, but this way it'll also be something like, like a nice add-on to what you always do. Um, does that make sense? Totally makes sense. Totally. Yeah. You want to try something? Can some I try that? that? Okay. So the main, the, the initial uh, pattern was. That's it. You now just it. put it onto the hi hat. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Can I do it? There you go, absolutely. Now there, there's only one thing that makes a lot of sense, I think, which is kind of lowering the hi-hat a little. Okay. So, uh, so your position behind the drums becomes a bit more relaxed. You don't have to move up your shoulder that much. Plus, uh, you can use more of an American, or if you wanted, even German position on the hi-hat. So you would have more access to being able to accent 
like so, which is a little different if you have your thumb on top. Sure, and I could see, yeah, I could see how that makes sense. Let me lower this down real yep. quick. Automatically, I'm more comfortable with a little bit of molar yeah, it, on my left hand. It, it may be, yeah. Kind of thing. Absolutely, and there are some players like, uh, like uh, Billy Cobham has it really same level. Right. Or, or Simon Phillips, Phillips yeah. let, let, let's say. Um, I like that little of a, of a difference in, in level because that would still get me out of trouble when I play something with both hands on the hi-hat. Because once the hi-hat is too low, my knuckles are kind of scratching against the, the, the head of the drum, which I don't like too much. Plus, you have a number of extra features like you can do So you have an extra sound, sure. even, or you can... <laughs> create some sort of... That was amazing! Pandero-like yeah. fake in, in Brazilian music. Okay, but, but so far about the, about the size of, of the, or the, the height of the Hyatt, right. and lowering it quite significantly can really be uh, 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 I mean, an important aspect in feeling a bit more comfortable behind the kit and relaxing yourself and not coming up with one shoulder, which may also help with posture sure. and at times even health-related aspects of feeling, say, more centered behind the kit and not being tight or tense up your, up your shoulders or upper arms. So that makes a lot of sense. And then using that bit of new vocabulary like as a mix between what you always do and then just throwing that in. Want to try that? Like I'll try one that. bar of a groove and one bar of your new thingy. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. It feels comfortable, but I also feel, I mean, since it's, I don't play like that that often, I still feel yeah. myself thinking about it quite a bit, but I could see how you just do it for a little bit of time and just get the, the body motion will start just kind of seeping into you and you don't have to think about it so much. Like I'm thinking I'm playing open-handed, but I'm, I imagine that will go away relatively quickly if I just did it a little bit more. Of course, and as with everything, it's, it's just a matter of routine. If you do it for, for quite some time, your hearing and your expectations towards the sound would automatically benefit from that. There's also one thing that, that is often forgotten, which is, uh, I mean, uh, when, when we think of a pattern that we play, of course we do think in sounds like doom, chik, chik, goom, chik, dak, dak, goom. but uh, all of a sudden, without us really noticing that, our brain is translating those sounds into movements. So whenever you hear that hi-hat sound or you think hi-hat, of course, at a certain point in time, as you play the drums for quite a while, that hi-hat sound becomes assigned, if you will, to your right hand. So all of a sudden, you now hear this sound, but it comes from your left hand, and that may give you a strange twist in your, in your brain. So it takes a little time to, to adjust to that and, um, and really be aware of, of trying to to understand that a certain sound that you have been using always from your right hand now all of a sudden comes from your left hand and that takes some time of adjustment. But um, still these uh, little 30 second note inserts, if you will, uh, you can place them in any other position just as well. So imagine if you had And you play this again, strictly alternating right, left, right, left, or left, right, left, right, I should say. And you make it this. There's a hidden benefit of playing open-handed, which opens up avenues towards discovering patterns that you were not aware of. Like what I just did now may appear to you as, okay, it's just that rhythm, but really, 
Both of my hands play the clave rhythm. Check this out. So that also kind of opens your mind towards uh, yet a different world where your hearing skills and your perception of rhythm may greatly benefit from that whole game of playing open-handed. Sure. You want to try that? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes? No? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, feels so basic. Ha! That's hard. So, sounded great though. Still, yeah, <laughs> keep going, that's keep all right. Going. You know what I could see automatically too is the feeling of opposite. Now that your left hand is leading and you hit that kick drum on, just on the downbeat, a real simple yeah. pattern like that, well, your right foot is hitting the downbeat with your left hand is hitting the downbeat. So you have this kind of diagonal motion between your limbs too, so you get this, the independence really starts coming in to play as well. Absolutely, and, uh, and as you notice with my kid, I have a, a, a lot of sounds are appearing in both halves of the kit. Yeah. And there's a, there's a certain system to it, which we're gonna speak about at some later point, but still, it makes a lot of sense to use the same pattern, uh, the, the same sounding pattern, I should say, but uh, look into different organization of your limbs. Let's say. A ton of different flavors just by moving your hands to it, another sound source. It is, but understanding the, the, the sound when, when you play it with another hi-hat is very much the same, I'd say, but since now all of a sudden you got your right hand moving and here your left hand moving, you automatically balance your abilities. And, uh, and it finally all comes down to the fact that I think in, in all those years of, of teaching that, I never met a drummer who would say, I, I wouldn't like to improve my weak hand. Sure, so of course. Balancing the abilities of your hands uh, along with the abilities of how you uh, understand your playing and, and what your rhythmic perception would be, that's actually that point where all leads down to creating music. It's not just a technical ability like do, do something like that. There's got to be a reason for that. And uh, picking the different sounds that you organize around you and being able to do that left and right hand leading is just the greatest way to find more artistic expression behind this little playground here. Well, with that being said, can we go up, I mean, one notch? Sure, and as you were saying, I, I wrote two books about the, about the, the topic, and, uh, and in those two uh, educational releases, it's Open Handed Playing Volume 1 and Volume 2 that I wrote together with Dom. It's not that Volume 1 is easier and Volume 2 is harder. They just feature different ways of how you organize your open-handed playing. In Volume 2, for instance, there's a whole chapter on the use of rudiments. And quite some of that is about using rudiments in a way that I really, I really never saw it conceptualized with with any other book. So I'm, I'm kind of tapping my own shoulder here, I know, but uh, uh, there's really something it. to it, and it's not rocket science. So let's pick a paradiddle, okay. everyone knows a paradiddle, and let's replace certain spots of the paradiddle with bass drum. So we have some kind of overlap here between the concept of using a, a, a rudiment, but also using a linear structure, if you will. So quite some of what you're about to hear now, um, at a certain point, begins to sound like uh, David Garibaldi. Okay. A little bit. So imagine the first segment of your paradiddle is going to replace the snare from the bass drum. So it's going to be 
Okay. The second block is going to be as you would expect it to be, and maybe just let that sink in and try try this. Okay, yeah. and so forth. You, you get the idea, right? Yeah, yeah. The, the paradiddle, or the mill, as it's called in European tradition of, of rudiments, is actually a pretty good example because it naturally changes the sticking from right to left. Even if you would say, okay, open-handed, leading with my left, I, I'm not sure if I can do that. All of you guys out there have been playing a paradiddle. Yeah, you're right. They've kind of so, already so doing it. So you already do it, right? Okay, so... Checking out the third and the fourth segment of the paradiddle, which is going to be... That's number three. Okay. And... Yeah, so let's take those two babies okay. and combine it with, again, half a bar of a groove, so you have... You got it, right? Okay. So let's put the four of them together. I'm going to be playing them for you one more time to, so to, to just remember those. With one bar of groove. Okay, but you get the idea, I right? get the idea, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and you can use that as in, in the function of a fill, let's say, or a variation. You could also use it as a standalone groove and all of a sudden you, you, you get some Tower of Power-like So, so you, you get there, right? And um, again, as everyone knows a paradiddle, just looking at it from a slightly different point of view sure. and uh, creating some new vocabulary, creating something that you didn't play before in the cross-handed fashion would automatically expand, expand the, the things you can say from your instrument or through your instrument. So would you give us an example of doing that sort of thing but like around, utilize your whole setup? Here we go. Let me hear what it sounds like. <laughs>
mean, it's, it's not crazy difficult in that regard. It's just um, a different way of uh, trying to find creative output. I mean, you may have to spend some, some extra moment and lean back and say, okay, what is creativity? And personally, I feel creativity has to do something with handling imperfect things. Okay. You work with what you have, right? And you you go from there. Creativity is also usually always an act of rebellion. You're rebelling ag against certain rules that you have learned at a certain point in time. But learning the rule before you break them is something that I think is important because if you just do it like in a random fashion, that's not really creative. It's just noodling around, okay? So using these tools and uh, of course in the beginning, it's not going to be perfect. You, you're going to be struggling with stuff, but on that journey, you will discover things and embracing the likeliness that mistakes are going to happen. This is, I mean, for me, a big part of the enjoyment on the on the way. It's it's the, it's the pleasure that I feel when I play the drums. I just like that. It's my game. Mistakes will happen, and so what? Right. Who cares? I still like playing the drums. It's not about being perfect. Well, Klaus, thank you so much for that amazing information. I've been playing drums a long time, but even these little nuances of how to change it up for, to a person who's played for a long time is very exciting. I mean, I have stuff I could go home tonight with and just and see how I can utilize this in my own playing. It's really good. So I appreciate that and thank you very much for sharing that with us. So tell the folks where they can find your books and let's give you a little bit of a promo on your products. So all my books are actually released uh, through Alfred Music and uh, Wisdom Media. You can find them with Alfred Music Publishing. You can find them through my own website, which is klaushessler.com. And of course, you can connect with me through Instagram and all that shoot and caboodle, right? So there's a number of books that I put out. It's Open Handed Playing Volume 1 and 2, my DVD on Technique, which is Drumming Kairos. There's Daily Drum Set Workout, which where this first example uh, actually came from. And um, there is Camp Duty Update, which is talking about history of rudiments and applying that in a pretty adventurous way, let's call it. There's Tala Diddle, which connects rudiments and Indian rhythms. So quite some stuff to talk about. And uh, all of these things are finally meeting each other on a educational online hub that I'm running, which is called openmindeddrumming.com. So this appears to be very much a natural extension of my releases in book and DVD format and poster format. Again, there's quite a number of comprehensive courses which are coming up there together with my cousin, Annika Nilles, that you may know. Norwell, And yeah. uh, Ramon Montagnier, who's now on board, and my friend Claudio Spieler, taking care of the Indian stuff. So, monthly live meetings, so there's a lot of things to be said about this. So, you may want to check it out and, uh, and have a look at some of the free content. If you see what you like, let me know. For sure. I encourage you to definitely check out all of Klaus's stuff, even just some YouTube footage, all of his great educational content. Thank you so much for being here. Um, can we go out with a little bit more playing? Of course, anytime. Right. Thank you, man. You lead the way. <laughs>